didn't bring you this far Believe you Despite the trials and hell you've been through Yet there's so much he promised he's gone through He won't let you down Although you feel the world on your shoulders Never put too much on us to hurt us And although the ups and downs continue to try to break us It won't let you down Ain't that a beautiful world? I keep going You're gonna keep rolling I love that song He won't let you down I don't care what life is bringing you. I don't care what weight is on your shoulder. He, meaning my savior, my deliverer. I don't know what you call him, but let him be a power that's higher than yours. But just know that he won't let you down. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what pain you're in. He won't let you down. Man will let you down. We will even, we'll let our own self down. But God will not allow himself to let you down. Y'all know who it is. It's Pastor Sandy Bailey Gwynn. And today is a good day to be up on the wake up list instead of the obituary list. You have found yourself on Faith to Move Forward season two, y'all. Season two. Because of y'all, we have made it to season two in the third month. So we thank you for that. We thank you for the support. We thank you for the donations. But we always know you can't do this by yourself. You need a village. And I can truly say our village is expanding all because of you. And with that being said, you know what? Share, like, this is a day. This is a conversation you don't want anybody to miss. When I'm telling you, the audience, the panelists that I have coming tonight, we got them coming from Atlanta, uh, virtual, well, virtual Atlanta but she came from Alabama. We have somebody who was once in Gainesville, but now has moved to Texas. And I don't know where Dr. Tim Cook's from, but she's in Atlanta as well. But I can tell you, these daughters of Zion, they're going to bring truth. They're going to bring power to truth. They're going to bring creativity. They're going to bring so much love. And most of all, they're going to bring sisterhood. So I'm excited. We got some things that are coming throughout the, the month. To, this month, we're celebrating women. Women, we're going to love on you. This panel discussion is called Greatness Belongs to Me, Not HIV. Whatever your circumstances is, it does not determine your destiny, only your determination. That determines your destiny. So that's this week. In two weeks, we got a serious panel discussion then. We have someone that used to be in substance abuse. Now she's a counselor. We have someone who once was homeless. Now she's counseling people from homelessness to being in a home. And then we have an attorney that specializes in free legal services for people who are trying to get out of a domestic violence situation. Girl, you can't tell me God won't send us what we need. So today, again, I need for you to share. I need for you to like because we're getting ready to get down with faith to move forward. So my first guest, I'm going to bring in for everybody just to make sure you're at the right spot. Dr. Tim Cooks. If you could come in, Dr. Tim. Good evening. Thank you for having me. How you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing greater. Just seeing your smile and, and hearing your praises and prayers. Oh, my God. So you at the office? I am at the hospital. Oh, you at the hospital? At the hospital. All right. We ain't going to stay on long because I know you got a family that you got to go to. So I'm, I'm going to respect that. But thank you for coming. I'm going to put you back in the green room. The next person I want to want y'all to see is a new friend of mine. Her name is Kim Moon. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, Pastor Sandy. I am glad to be here with you today. Mm, thank you, because I know you're going through some pain. But baby, yeah. when this it's is okay. over with, when it's over with, I promise you, you will feel different. Oh, but yes. I no, promise you. I believe that. Oh, God. Okay. All right. My next friend who I met when she gave me a chance to preach at her church. 
And then she moved away. But I know her as Pastor Kai Horn. But I believe some things has changed. And now she's added on some stuff. Miss Kai. Hello, 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 Pastor Sandy. How are you? I am good. I'm so glad you said yes. Yeah, peace to you. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And it is, it's Dr. Kai Horn El Amin is my last name. We go, you're going to explain that. you go going to okay. explain all the happiness and the okay. joy with the transition. Glory to God. Yes, yes, we can do that. We can do Woo! that. I told y'all ladies, this conversation it's all about women and how sometimes we got to transfer a transition in the right place. I feel it already. I don't know about y'all. I feel freedom already. Okay. All right. Can I go back in the back? Let me see who I want to start with first. Um, I'm okay. I'm going to start with Ms. Moon. I'm going to start with Ms. Moon first. <laughs> I'm ready. Girl. So let me ask you something. You from Alabama. I am, girl. Can't you tell? Listen. No. Listen. <laughs> so I had your flyer out, and a friend of mine inboxed me. Do you know Eve Taylor? Trey? I do. I do. I do. So you probably know, I'm getting ready to be real transparent. My ex-husband's family. Who is His your ex His dad name is, uh, 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 the brother was Leroy Robbins, but we, the husband, my, my ex-father-in-law that's a crying shame uh-uh uh-uh it's in the past that's why <laughs> 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 no Girl. disrespect it's in the past <laughs> Boom. okay we're gonna get right we're gonna get right with god focus tell me, we're gonna focus tell <laughs> me who you are and what do you do and how do you uplift women so my name is Kim Moon, as, as you already stated. I am a HIV education consultant, and I I try to uplift women because one, I'm a HIV uh, advocate and activist uh, because I am a HIV positive uh, person, a person living with HIV. Right. I try to be politically correct. That is right. Uh, it's an inkling of who I am. It, that's why I really don't think about it. I know a lot of people focus on it. I don't because it is just a small inkling of what I have. You know what I'm saying? So I what don't I, really. Greatness don't, belongs to me. Yeah. Yeah. It, that It's irrelevant to me, but I have HIV. So therefore I try to uplift women because one thing I realize about women is that we love to be loved. And we look for it and we seek for it and we try to find it. Even sometimes when it's not there, we don't ask questions. We don't ask history. We don't ask anything. We just want it because we all feel like we need it. We all want to be loved. We do. I do too. Come on, Kim. But HIV calls me to ask some questions, okay? And I, yeah. Now, guess what? I I hate to tell people this. I was raped when I contracted HIV. But my reason for hating to tell people, because I ain't no saint. I ain't always been that, okay? I got three babies. They grown. I, they still my babies. My oldest one, 39, and my, my youngest one is 32. My middle one, 36. So... I'm just saying like, but I got them and I'm not married. Right. So could have easily contracted that way. I, what I say all the time is this, that means I've had sex at least four times in my life unprotected. Four times. The three times I willfully had sex and rape. I got you. Yeah. And so, but I think I, I try to uplift women because I want women to learn to love themselves. Yes. I want women to learn to have conversations. I want women to spot out immediately. When somebody is not for it, don't take long. A conversation can happen. And sometimes you'd be like, oh, yeah, no, do that for me. But Kim, but Kim, I am seeing, I, I'll be 50 this year. And I, I tell people, if my husband and I were to divorce, I would not want to be in the dating scene. Uh, for one, I know the numbers of STIs, but I also know 
some of us are so vulnerable, like you said, to have somebody. And, yeah. and I'm used to having somebody, but at what state am I going to lose who I am just to say I got somebody? Do you know how many women do lose who they are just to say they have somebody? Just to say they have somebody. They will date anything or anybody just to say they got somebody beside them. But guess what? I believe this. If you learn to love yourself, anything, and I do mean anything, that you think he can do for you, you can do for yourself. Because you're so confident and so, you know, sure of who you are and whose you are, it doesn't matter. It doesn't even matter. Because I, I I love me. Yeah, I can let's talk about time. this. Okay, girl, You said on. something. You had three kids. Mm -hmm. How effective and how does shame a play in moving on, moving into greatness? Listen to me. My first child, I was in the ninth grade. Mm -hmm. I brought shame to my family. I brought shame to my mom. I stayed out of school six weeks because that's what you could do. You know what I'm saying? I mean, well, a semester, really, not mm -hmm. six weeks. I stayed out of school for a semester. I made those classes up during summer school and during the school year. But then... My father, um, I got pregnant again as a senior. Then my father was killed in January. I was eight and a half months pregnant. I'm a senior in high school. I don't really know what I'm going to do now. I brought shame once again. I got a twin brother. All I know is I want to walk across the stage with this dude. That at least make my mama proud that way. Because I done just messed up the proud thing. You know, and 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 let me let me back up. I was angry with my mom because I was a cheerleader. I was all of that. And then I had a sister who was in college and she had a baby. Her baby's name was Shay. And I remember my mom coming to my cheerleading practice and saying, hey, Kim, I hate to say this, but you're going to have to quit because I need you to help raise Shay so I can work so Brandon can stay in college. So I think my rebellious self is why I ended up pregnant. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm I'm mad, I'm angry, I'm taking care of a child. I don't have one. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I was a cheerleader. I was I was a popular chick. I was a cute chick. I thought, but now I got to take care of a baby. So guess what I did? You pregnant. got pregnant. Yeah, twelfth grade got pregnant again. Cause see, all that cheerleading stuff was over once you had a first baby. You know, so. Anyway, I had my second daughter, February, February 24th, stayed out of school two weeks. Spring break came. Then I had that, that gave me my third week. I went back to school. I got a job. I worked at Russell Corporation, third shift. I know. I worked night shift from 10 to 6. Got off at 6 in the morning, came home, took a shower, got my kids ready, took them to daycare. I went to school. I got out of school at three. I picked them up. I fed them, did whatever I had to do, went to sleep, woke up at 930 and went to work at 10. That was my last March, April, May. When graduation came, guess what Kim Moon was? She graduated with, the, with her twin brother. She went home while everybody else went partying. Prom didn't go. I didn't go to my senior nor junior prom. None of that. Cause I was having babies. So you talk about shame very much, but I think I still walk in victory because my mom instilled that into me, into me. I'm happy. I'm healthy. I'm humble. I'm wealthy. I'm strong. I am a champion. I am victorious. That was, I didn't believe it, but I said it. Even at that age, even at that age, I said it. Didn't believe it though. Then, then, I have another baby, but I'm an adult now, so I moved out. I've worked. I'm doing good, but I, I got another baby. Yet I'm single again. Can't have no more babies. We about to get rid of this. We ain't doing no more of this. Tubes tied, okay? How old were you, Kim? 23. And you got your tubes tied at 23? Yep. Got my tubes tied at 23. Didn't care. Didn't know if I would ever be married because I knew I wasn't going to give another man a baby. <laughs> It didn't matter. And then when I moved to Georgia, 
one year at, after I moved to Georgia. That was right. One year later, my mom died. That was rough. That was rough because it always happened that way. It never happens in this one thing. It's always a lot. It's always like I'm I'm eight and a half months pregnant. My dad died. Two weeks later, my grandmother died. Then I had this baby. I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to graduate still as a senior. So I stayed out of school 10 weeks. Got nobody but God gave me them 10 days, I mean, and then gave me spring break. That gave me three weeks and then allowed me to go back to school and graduate and work a third shift job. Nobody but God. Same thing like this knee. It didn't just happen. I have had five surgeries this year. Three of them was kid. One of them was a tumor just removed. It wasn't serious. Three kidney stone procedures. Two knee surgeries. I'm saying this year, but starting last year to up to this year. It never happens. Oh, and I broke up with my boyfriend. He was cheap. It never happens like easily. It comes out of storm. Look, you got a question. How did you heal with everything coming at you left and right? Letitia Turner. How did you heal, Kim? From which time? Who that's a I'm just saying, like from which time? I got a feeling for this one, I want to say probably in your 20s to get you to your 30s. In my 20s, I had a mother, to a praying mother. I went to church, whether I believed it or not. And I'm being, I'm being totally That's trend. why we're here. Whether I believed it or not, I still went to church every Sunday. Sung in a choir, sung in the community choir, but I still was doing whatever I wanted to do. I still tried to believe God, but I was still wondering, is this real? When I tell you I'm feeling your conversation because there's so many of my viewers that has walked your same walk, maybe not three kids, maybe not two, but but one. And they had to adjust education. They missed a prom. They they missed prom queen, but then they just had to be pushed in life. And that is yeah. still there. And then you got daddy dying, who's a major part of your family. Then you have your mom died. And if you, any Ray, black person. Look, Ray, HIV, mama died. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> Whoa. Your mama got to be real bad for you not to love her. So any black person, <laughs> ma- mama is like the nucleus. Right. And you're young, you going through this, you get this diagnosis. But Kim, you had to tell a story. You didn't kill yourself. You didn't shoot yourself. I didn't think about it though. It ain't because I didn't think about it. I don't now. But then I did. My, I sent my son back to Alabama to live with my mom. This was when the rape happened because he's a he's a mama's baby, and he you we used to lay in the bed and sing to each other, sing each other to sleep. That was our thing. And I remember I couldn't do that. I I just, I I couldn't. And I sent him back to Alabama, but I was still a supportive mother. I went to every game. I drove to Alabama, would drive back and then get up and go to work. I did everything I was supposed to do as a mother. I just, he just didn't live with me. But he knew you were there. He knew I was there. And, 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 and I remember driving down the road one, one, one night, late one night, leaving a football game. It's an 18 wheeler here, and it's an 18 wheeler here. And all I thought about was what if I just turn? I could end it all, and my pain would be over. But as I talked to God, I said, idiot you so protected you might kill the driver and you don't even die so only reason i didn't do it because i didn't want to hurt nobody else but i wanted to god knows i did i did i did kim i'm gonna tell everybody how that story is identical to me with me and my husband was getting ready to get divorced, but we we go wait. Kim, I let you go back to the green room. I'm gonna bring up uh, 
I'm gonna change the dot the the dynamics. Let's bring up uh Pastor Kai. Um, yeah, let's bring up Kai right quick. Mm. So, mm. girl, <laughs> I knew mm. this was gonna be a a deep one, but I didn't think it was gonna go like this. Uh, mm. God. <laughs> You're right, Kimberly Harris. Thank God for grace and mercy. Uh, you, I don't even know where to start. I, I mean, you support, girl. You got your own story. You got your own story with your own baby, working through greatness, working through hurt, working through. I ain't gonna say shame, but working through uncertainties. You know, I, I will say working through shame. Let me start there. And I, I'm going to go somewhere that many may not agree with, but it's very important that they hear me out. The church does not do sex or sexuality well. It is so taboo that we can talk about every other kinds of healing. We can speak of every other kind of deliverance. We can speak about the fruit of everything else. But when it comes to sex and sexuality, it is so taboo that it's it's not just Sister Kim, it's not just me, it's not just you. You have so many people in the church institution who are hurting and cannot speak their truth because they miss the judge that you may not be judge. They miss that. So you talking about leadership missed that. I'm talking about leadership and the pew. I'm talking about leadership and the pew because you have there those who in leadership who miss it. And, and I'll share with you why they miss it. it, 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 it on this side, on, on this side of the altar, I think it's missed because of the projection. Because if I really begin to talk about sex and sexuality, then I really will have to get into what I may or may not be doing. And so then I begin to project. Someone comes in. Kim needs healing. She needs comfort. She needs a touch. She needs love. She needs to know uh, that God is indeed her God. And that beside God, there is none other. She needs to know that God is her judge and her jury. That God has never left her nor forsake her. And then so we turn HIV AIDS into a homosexual disease. So then we began to uh, uh, exalt that this is or, or play up that this is this is a homosexual disease. And so now we have a condemnation. Uh, of homosexuals within our congregation, same gender loving is my preferred word. We have, uh, we begin to put the same gender loving community on display for sexual sins. And 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 what 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 I see, especially in the church of the day of today, we have forgotten to listen to the story. We have forgotten that everyone has a story. My baby, uh, 13 years old, and she um, gets pregnant. I am a pastor in a church. And in our area, although smaller than many of the other churches, because it is the only CMN church, it, it, and, and we have uh, some say in the community. You know, we have some standing in the community um, with our ministry. And so the world stops. And even some of the members of the church turned against me, shamed me, and said that uh, they, they really didn't no longer wanted me as a pastor, laughed 
uh, some of the people within the connection shamed me because of my daughter becoming pregnant and didn't know the whole story. Wow. But it gets deeper when she was killed. I was shamed again. Didn't know the whole story. It's so funny because uh, Gaines, Gainesville reported the story and they reported what was in the paper in Fulton County. I sent a letter to them that they ignored to say, I've talked to homicide detectives. I've talked to ATF. I've talked to a lot of people. That's not the story. That's what the paper reported. And so we, we have forgotten the, the stories. And, and let me tell you something else about the church. The church has forgotten how to see themselves in the biblical story. Some have become so Jesus-centered. I, I know this is going to cause some controversy. <laughs> so Jesus-centered that we are no earthly good or no yeah, relational yeah. good. Yeah, 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 yeah. We've forgotten to see ourselves in, in Tamar, who 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 uh, finally positioned herself as a, a temple prostitute to get justice. Come on, him. Come on. To get justice. Truth. We we we've forgotten uh, uh, about Zelophehad's daughters, who didn't have a brother, but but the inheritance was theirs. We well, have yeah. forgotten. So we've forgotten to see ourselves in the stories. We, we, we get the woman with the issue of blood. We, we talk about her and, and, and run around and listen to the story and everyone shouts their troubles over. But why couldn't the doctors do anything? That's, that's a very real issue. And it's a very real issue from an economic standpoint, because I, I know this is not te technically my part of the conversation, but uh, while the health care, while we have adequate health care now, we do realize that HIV AIDS has a history and it has a history of there being adequate health care, but not everyone being able to receive it. Yeah. 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 So, so th this, 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 this issue of, of, how we navigate these waters in spiritual settings. Because let, let me say something else. Um, in my duality, I affiliate uh, with uh, one of the masters there in Atlanta by way of Zoom. And here's what, what, it, what is amazing to me. Christianity is the faith tradition that says that they have it all, but don't want to talk about the things when healing needs to be. Explain that. And then once you do that, we're going to move on to the doctor. But tap into that. What you saying, Doc? There are other traditions. There are other traditions that get to the meat of what? Of, of women, of the healing that's needed, of the empowerment that's needed so that the community can heal. And so I said we've forgotten to see ourselves in the story, but I think we've forgotten to see ourselves in the koinonia in the fellowship, in the community, in the, I, I know you got to go to the next person, but. No, but. But, but what you're saying is one of the things that I want to uplift and Dr. Tims, I'm going to allow her to do that even through medicine. We, as women, we have forgotten the true power that we hold. God made right. no mistakes when he called for the weeping women. He right. made right. no right. mistake. Right. 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 And there's a shift where we need to get back to when segregation happened and you they took the women to build communities. The Those, men go ahead. Sorry. We've got to get back to carry us through. And education, fellowship has to be all of that. We are the only ones who can adequately bring people to the table because the table was part of our ministering right. And, and we have forgotten how to use those things that are innately us, mm -hmm. those God-given gifts, 
to begin to heal, deliver, restore, love, and empower. We have forgotten them. And 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 I re- was I t- listening to, to Sojourner Truth. If one world if, if one woman could turn the world upside down, you think all of us ought to be able to turn it right side up again. And, and, and it is going to begin with these truths. I had a statement where uh, what, what some people do in, in situations like with Sister Kim and with all of us, because I, I in, in kind of preparing for this dialogue, I began to look at some of the current uh, uh, videos and read current articles regarding HIV AIDS. And uh, I noticed it when when and 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 sister sister Kim uh, supported this when she shared her story that when you have loss because because the moment somebody tells you that you have something in your body that you can't get rid of and you you start in anticipatory grief right then because you don't know what to do it is a type of trauma to your body, to your psyche, to your spirit. God, I served you. Why? Okay, you got to go. Go, go. We have people that, that, that people, the, the gossipy people, someone put the only time the church wants to talk about sex is when it's gossip. Who's sleeping with who? We have trauma-informed questions. They'll ask you what happened. That's a, that's a, that's a, uh, uh, that's a, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry. We have a, a a trauma-informed question where they ask you what happened. We have a trauma-uninformed question, and they ask you what's wrong. What you do? What's going on? Yeah, I'm bringing on ourselves. All right, Doc. We're bringing up the other doctor because you are literally leaning in to where she's going to start off. Doctor Tim Cook. Lord Jesus. Okay. I people share hearts. I told you. This right here, it's like no other. We we got Shadon McCants chime in all the way from Houston. I just said that earlier. It is time for women to claim their places back at the table. Goddess Queens, Andy Bro, Andy Dukes, Amen. Uh, Monica, United Women, um, unite among the women is so important. We can conquer the world. Doctor Tim Cooks, you don't heard Kim, you don't heard Kai. What you gonna add to that? What you gonna bring? Because your medicine, your faith, your love for the community, I know what you gonna add. You gonna add all of that. Yeah. Right, right. So, you know, I again, I, I can't uh, thank you enough for sharing the evening with everyone who's on the panel and being a part of your show. You know, um, the place that I'd like to start. And, you know, I was thinking about this even before I heard the comments that have been uh, made so far. I think one of the most disappointing things um, that I know that people believe about this profession that I'm in is that we don't care. We're all about the money. We're all about this. And I, I can assure you that those of us who are in it um, we are the, the commitment started decades ago. And I, I like to tell the story that my my commitment to medicine actually started when I was five and I have done nothing but read, study, serve, you know, the, the people that I care about. So, you know, I wanted to start there to say I hope people rekindle their belief in medicine and in the healthcare profession. Mm -hmm. Not everybody's bad. There are those of us who really do care. And we put um, every resource that we have into the service of other people. I know for me, and to to answer um, your first question, you know, how do I serve women? You know, I I have to start even um, with my mother. I think it starts there. And as a teenager, I watched her go through a very difficult divorce. And, you know, all this lady wanted was to keep her family intact, to, you know, do all those things that, you know, people feel a woman should do. And it didn't quite work out that way for her. And I think she's been devastated ever since then. And that's been in the 80s. And I think for me, I developed... um, I don't know, something that I I, um, recognize in other women 
through what I saw my mother go through. And in terms of how that has played out in HIV, I think one of the things that um, the stories that I heard women um, speak about that HIV really for us as African-American women has so little to do with the lifestyle that we lead personally, but it's about what happens to us. You know, I hear women say that all they had was one partner. Sometimes that one partner was a spouse and that's not to bash men. I love men. I have a wonderful spouse who's very supportive, but things happen yeah. and uh, and we live out the consequences of that. So I started an organization simply to support ladies so they could see you're not the only one who's dealing with this. I know for us, it's hard to step out. The stigma's very real. Um, the condemnation can be greater. And it makes us not seek out the support that we're really needing. And so we cry behind, behind closed doors. We suffer in silence. And little do we know that there are thousands of other women who are living the same experience. And again, coming together, coming to the table to recognize that when, when we share our experiences, when we um, seek out common solutions, we can really do great things together. So Heather Ivy Society, um, which is the support group that I founded, seeks to do just that. It's to give women that safe space, just have a discussion, even like what we're having tonight. Know that, you know, my, you know, I, I came home and, you know, I, I saw my husband's phone and that is how I found out, you know, that he was cheating. I got tested and, you know, I, discovered that I, you know, now have something that I need to take medication for. So, you know, th they're those enriching, enduring um, stories that, um, you know, just coming together as women serving women is uh, the, the platform that I think is very important for us to do as, as a service. Um, I'm loving the fact that you broke down one it's okay to trust your, your health physician because we already know what has happened throughout the years with healthcare and trauma. And what I, when I was writing white medicine, because that's all my parents or my ancestors had to go through, but through time, through encouraging women, innovative women, such as yourself, people before you that were women of color that took the time to say, you know what, I may catch hell, but I'm going to become a doctor. I may catch hell, but I'm going to become a nurse. I may catch hell, but I'm going to become a teacher. So what you saying that has reassured us, it's okay to trust our doctors now. It, it, it's okay, women serving women. Thank you, Monica, because she's a nurse. So you have just eased up a lot of women to understand that, yes, there's some that has been starting this mentally since they were five years old. And you also said something to the fact that I saw my mother go through this. Absolutely. I mean, you know, look look at where I am right now. I, I haven't had dinner. I haven't, you know, I haven't left the hospital. So this is all part of just a day's work. This is service and I don't feel tired. That is exactly what God calls us to do. I, I listen to you pray. I could never pray like that. You're called to do that. And I think when we step into exactly what God has called us to do, it comes with a grace that we're able to do it. And so I get so much joy seeing uh, ladies who, you know, when they first come, their heads are held low. Um, they, you know, um, you know, there's just a, a whole um, countenance of shame. And then when they realize that, you know what, as Kim stated, this is just a, a little, this is a little piece of who I am. It's irrelevant. It is irrelevant. And so to see people kind of graduate and evolve to that, you know, is a wonderful thing. It makes all of it worthwhile. And, um, you know, th there are so many other uh, providers who are in it to serve. And, you know, I also love it also when, because uh, I, I moved to Atlanta, back to Atlanta in 08. And, um, and I think I'm one of probably just a handful of African-American women who happen to be infectious diseases specialists. And so it was kind of funny when I first moved because, you know, we go in the exam room, the doors would close and they say, so are you the doctor? Hmm. 
say, yeah, it's like, really? And it's like, you know, you, you can just unload and feel free to really express exactly what you need to express. Like, I get it. Like, I know and can relate. Um, and so it's that part of it, just, you know, having um, someone who looks like you, someone who's going through what you've gone through. When you, people talk about relationship issues, I get it. When people talk about hair issues, I get it. When people talk about kid issues, children, I get it. And so we're, we're all a part of this. We're all bringing our gifts to the table to serve. Here's a question. I believe this is for you, Monica Williams, and it's going to lead in what you just talked about. It says, why do so many women feel like we have to cry in silence behind the door? If, if only we knew like what, what we're trying to do is break down these these walls so that women can really have a chance to see that your story is not unique. You're not the only one that this this uh, trauma that happened to you. There is a sister who it's also happened to. And if you only knew that and could only have that bond to get through your, your troubles and someone who, who when, when you're having a bad day, maybe she supports you and vice versa. But um, I think, you know, we, we have had historically such um, pristine expectations. You know, they're just things ladies don't do. Oh God. And, and we're, we're human. We're all human. And, uh, you know, having a chance to speak on those things, you know, there, there are certain things all of us are guaranteed to do. We were all born. We all got to eat. I can assure you, everybody's been hungry before. Everybody's mm -hmm. been sleepy before. Everybody's had emotional ups and downs. Mm -hmm. Everyone has had sexual desires. That is such a ingrained part of being human. And so to have any shame about that, I think it's, it's almost asinine. It's like, what adult wouldn't? And so that's what we speak about in visits. It's like, just tell us. Like, we're, we're here to make sure you are healthy and intact. So tell us everything. And what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. We are just going to make sure when you go home, you go home, you know, everything is checked, everything reset button is set. So, you know, it's, it's part of being human. That's what's up. Uh, Shadon, baby, you you working it all the way from Houston. So she answered Monica's question. She said, unfortunately, Monica is legacy burdens. As women, we have been trained to be strong and cry, dare not cry, tears for a long time seen as weakness. And mm -hmm. you're right. We, we as black women, we just learn to keep moving e even through it. But now God is allowing us to understand it's okay to cry. If he cried at his friend's death, surely he gives us moments to release. Just don't stay there because he said 40 days, even another situation, 40 days, you got to keep moving. But he does give us that space to release ourselves. I'm, I'm going to switch it because I have um, on the call, Shadon Jones. She's out of uh, Wake Forest, one of my instructors. She is one of those ladies that is very, she wanted right, not just for herself, but for the purpose. She wants excellence in the purpose because the purpose produces other people to be good at what they do. Mm -hmm. My question to you, when we're in this season, how can we control and manage ourselves even when we're walking in the purpose? even when we, we're trying to get there, How, because we know mental health is a rise for women because we are recognizing it. You know, we just thought we had a headache. No, baby, that's pressure. <laughs> you need to sit down somewhere. Tell everybody to go home, take your grandkids home. And my husband, I'm going to fix you from collard greens and you get ready to go in your bedroom. How can we learn to manage ourselves? Kim, I'm going to start with you in the line of work that you do. So one, especially probably for me and uh, the cooks, I mean, you two ladies as well, I think when you serve people, that's anybody, you have to learn self-care because we're dump trucks. Mm. We're dump trucks. People dump their issues off on us. And if we don't have self-care, we'll carry them. And we'll make them, so, like me, I get so personal with it sometimes. I make them my own. You know what I'm saying? Like when, when my girlfriends or different people tell me about their issue, I get so 
caught up in wanting to help them that it's like I've made it my own. So I have to do self-care and self-care can mean anything from just stealing away to do not disturb on my cell phone to, to going to the spot. My, my, one of my best friends happened to be a massage therapist, a, a esthetician, and he's my hairstylist. Don't look like it now, but y'all I've been, you know, we, we can't, you're beautiful. <laughs> you're beautiful. But, but I'm just saying, like, I'll, I'll make an appointment and I want everything. I want all of it because I feel like I need that just to love on me because I feel like I deserve that. So, I know sometimes people believe that going shopping does that. Well, retail therapy doesn't do it for me because honestly, I feel like I go buy what I want, period. I need something that's going to be beneficial or I can feel like it's beneficial to me. Once I put that outfit on a wedding handbag, it no longer serves me a purpose. Whereas if I go get a massage or get my hair done, get my nails done, get my toes done, get a facial, I feel good about that for a period of time. You know what I'm saying? And I need that type of self-care. I got you. And I just believe that women need to learn how to do that take a step back read a book that's the one thing that we don't do we don't we don't take interest in things we want to watch youtube or instagram or facebook or all of, that is just a temporary song i got you yes it's a temporary song but when you can invest in you like i read self-help books i love to read them because guess what that's for me Good. I'm going to get something out of it, whether it's about my finances or whether it's about my health or whether it's about, you know, just decorating my house. It doesn't matter to me. I'm getting something out of it. So I believe that, you know, that's the that's one of the things that I think are important to me. Thank you, Kim. Kim, uh, one thing you, you said that we're going to have to talk about. Stop letting folks dump in you. Next. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, Kai, talk to that right there. You know, with the question that you originally asked, I have I, I have two things that I think do speak to that. Stop letting people dump in you. And I want to say these come from another life. I have 24 years of uh, ICU hospital chaplaincy as a board certified chaplain. As a matter of fact, just, just uh, gave up that position this past December to homeschool my grandson. And uh, my first thing was I said, take responsibility for our own healing. And, that, and that's what I hear Sister Kim saying. Uh, uh, social shame is real. Body shame is real. Mm -hmm. That internal voice that begins to speak to us, that sometimes gets us as women so down, that tells us we're nothing. And then like Joe, we have a couple of friends that come and put that uh, shame <laughs> in sure. us as well. Um, I think that's important. So there are some times that we have to say, look, we're imbalanced. Yeah. And there's some voices that we need to get rid of. There's some voices within us that we need to silence. And we need to be able to take responsibility mm -hmm. of our own. And, and part of that is not being afraid to go to therapy, Definitely. to a licensed therapist, you know, to say, we need some help. We need to talk this out in a, in a place where it can stay in a place where they will hear us and help us to walk through where we are. Because as I said earlier, this trauma process for women is a grieving process. And and I don't care how much of a, a problem that you have or what's going on in your life, there's always someone that's willing to dump. And their situation, uh, we don't say there is an uh, equality of situations, but we do say the emotions um, that go along with that. The emotions don't know whether you've just been diagnosed with something mm -hmm. or whether your daughter passed. The emotion is the same. Yeah. And so we have to begin to deal with that. And here's my second thought. Um, allowing your faith to shape your trauma and your trauma to shape your faith. Talk that. Say that again. Allowing your faith to shape your trauma and your trauma to shape your faith. Somebody put that in the comments. <laughs> there, there is, there is a passage. There's a couple of passages. There's one in uh, the Bible and one in the Quran. The one in uh, the Bible, I believe, is Second Corinthians four, 
And uh, I'm looking because I just want to make sure I look at my notes to remember it says 12 through 14. And what impressed upon me is this is the one that at the beginning of the first verse, it talks about our press towards the mark. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our press towards the mark, the high calling. And then at the end, it says, uh, uh, eyes have not seen, nor have ears heard, nor has it entered into man. And, and what are into humanity, what God has prepared for God's people. And, it, and if we really see ourselves, I'm talking about body ecology now, if we really see ourselves as women in the image of God, then we need to realize that the same preparation for anyone else, whatever God has prepared is the same preparation for us. God has no respect of person. And so so this this trauma that we go through, we need our faith to hold on to it and, and to hold on. I'm sorry, to hold on till we get to the healing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we we have this trauma, we're met with this trauma, and we reach out for our faith. And then in the midst of it, it's the trauma that causes the greater faith. And yet, will I trust in God? Why? Because eyes have not seen, oh. nor have ears heard. And, and I like another version. It says, nor has the heart imagined. We don't know what God is going to do in the process of our lives. Sister Kim is here to empower us to keep moving. So our situation is not her situation, but it empowers us to keep moving. So uh, our faith is informing our trauma. God said, God, God said, I'll be here. Now, I don't know what healing is going to look like. God is going to use these physicians because I do have some great physicians. I saw in the chat where one said, it's good to see that uh, Dr. Cook is there in, um, in Atlanta. Yes, there are some great physicians and there is the great physician working through the great physician. Yes. And so we have to take responsibility for our own healing. But we also have to allow our trauma to affect our faith, uh, to our faith to impact our trauma, while our trauma impacts our faith. Um, can I say, in the process of that, along with that scripture, continuing to press, continuing to press. Part of my journey that I did not speak of is early on uh, in ministry there in Dallas, when when HIV AIDS, I, I say was at its height, when we were hearing more about it. Let me say it about that. Uh, uh, I have with my godmother gone to clean houses where people told us, oh, don't clean the house, you're gonna catch it. Oh, don't sit on the toilet, you're gonna catch it. Oh, don't don't sit next to them, you're gonna catch it. No, no you, you can't eat. No, just fix your food over here and fix their food over there. And we still were in it. Don't go sit by the beds and, and be with them. Don't hold their hands. I'm, let me tell, I'm, I'm going to tell you a story. And then I know it'll be time for someone else to speak. But a young man that we uh, went to the hospital and they were sharing with him that he was going to pass at that point in time. And, um, they said that he was emitting spores and we didn't need to go in the hospital and we didn't need to go in the room. And, uh, and I was like, but, 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 but he, I know, I know we're risking something, but he needs to be touched because I believed in the touch of God. I believe in the touch of God. There is, uh, I talked about another passage where in the Quran, it says, uh, there, there is no disease created by which God does not have a cure. And so I was like, this young man needs to be touched. We put on masks, we put on uh, gowns, did everyone, I and one of the other ministers went in, we put on everything that we could to cover up shields on our face and everything and went in and we touched him. He cried because of the feeling of human touch that was not someone technically uh, of uh, a medical tradition that someone that was that could have been scared and could have been afraid touched him that young man lived four years later he came home he came home his t-cell count went up and he came to the church to let us know that he was touched so so we, we got we gotta press through the medicine, you gotta press. And 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 forgive me, I pray that I'm not being insensitive because because I know that I am not sitting here on that side. So 
I can't say that I know about that, Sister Kim, but I can say that I know about pressing. <laughs> I, when my only child was killed, my only child, life was taken at 23 years old, 20 years ago, uh, uh, two years next week, the 21st. I had to press. And every single day, I have to continue to press. There is a higher calling. There's a There's a goal. There's a goal. And I don't, eyes have not seen, nor have ears heard, nor has it entered into the hearts uh, of humanity what God has prepared. I don't know what's on the other side. I just know God is on this side. Mm. Y'all, so it's 726. Y'all give me some hearts if y'all want to keep going. Because, you know, I respect your time. Doc, I know you got to go. But when I tell you, I, I know the Holy Ghost and I know when he moving. Yeah. And I'm, I know I'm when okay. He, you okay. And I'm I know okay. when he's speaking. We got people chiming in across the country who's being healed. Yes. Talk to me, doctor. Talk. You know, I, I am loving it. You know, I, I will say I'm, I'm over 50 and my memory is not what it used to be. So I don't even remember the original question, but I know I agree. <laughs> I agree wholeheartedly with you have to press on. And I think, you know, I, I, I can't speak to that enough. One of my favorite stories in the Bible is when they crossed the Red Sea. And if you consider the circumstances, the context, they have an army behind them, so they can go backwards. They have a mountain, mountains on either side, so they can't climb over them. And they have a sea in front of them and they can't swim. Come on here. What do you do? And God instructed them, go forward. Just keep going forward. And so those things that we endure and go through in this season, somehow God always works that together for our good. It's just preparation for that next season that's coming. Talk, and so talk. as I have my daughters who are now teenage, I have one 19. I'm looking at my phone because she just landed. She just went back to school. I tell her all the time, don't ever forget that spiritual foundation that we made sure you take with you everywhere. And when times get hard, mommy can't always be there to solve your problems, but you go forward and you know exactly as um, Kai, Pastor Kai stated, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, hearts have not imagined the things that God has in store for you. So don't don't squirm, don't uh, fret, don't worry. Just your charge is do all that you can do. That is all God asks you to do. Whatever your gifts are, don't try to have somebody else's gifts. God made you you. And there is something on this earth that God designed you to do. So you fulfill it and God is going to take care of the rest. And so that that is what I live by every day. I, I do what I can and I allow God to fill the gap. Do, do what I can't do. Heal what I can't heal. This, this is all I can do. Medicine told me, write this script. That's all I can do. Now, the rest of the healing is up to the patient and God. Oh, so I, I take that full awareness into every encounter. I know it's not me. I will tell you it's not my colleagues either, but we serve as a conduit, an instrument to bridge the gap. Y'all, I knew this was going to be a good conversation, but I didn't know to what degree. But all of y'all have said so much to shift me to keep moving. Keep moving. Go As forward. As one of my nephews say, stay in my pocket. Yeah. Stay in the lane. Well, people don't understand. Stay in the lane. As long as God is God and you stay in the lane. Yes. Because if you get out of the lane and somebody's looking for you, you've just missed that opportunity. Stay in the lane. Stay in the lane. <laughs> Ooh, Titan says that spoke volumes. Bridge the gap. Y'all, uh, what do y'all have to say? And then we're gonna close it out. What y'all said so much. What what nugget do you want to leave with your people? 
I don't know what to say. I'm I'm speechless. I am. I'm just so grateful. I'm just so grateful. May I start? And, and I'll say this. I, I have a cousin who um, I've never met. He's in Arkansas. And he'll just randomly call. I think he's 80. And he got my number. He just randomly calls. And he gives me one message every time. And that's what I'm going to leave with everybody else. He always says, cuz, just keep trusting God. And that's, that is what, those are my words. And that's what I do. Just keep trusting God. Even when you don't understand God. Kim, what's your faith to move forward? What are you going to leave with the ladies so and the people? Because I am an HIV advocate, I first have to say to everybody on here, you got to get tested. Yeah. I, I got to ask you to do that because so many people are afraid to know. They're afraid to ask, you know, to, to be tested. You're not going to get tested going to a doctor saying, test me for everything. You have to say, I want an HIV test. So that's the first thing I have to say is, you know, get tested. The second thing I have to say is have conversations with your significant partners, husbands, wives, even whatever they are, have those conversations, those pertinent, important conversations, meaning have you been tested? Have you had any other you know, sexually transmitted infections. You know, let's go together. It's okay. You know what I'm saying? It's okay to get that test because knowing, yeah, it might change your life a little bit, but not a whole lot. But it can definitely mm -hmm. save your life. It can definitely save your life. And the last thing that I would say to anybody is just like Dr. Cook said, trust God in everything in in everything that you do regardless to where you go what you do trust god i i, I used to uh, women used to ask like how do you have so much confidence and i told them i look in the mirror when i used when i walk out the door i used to look in the mirror and i'd be like girl you look good today it's something about feeling good about yourself and knowing God is with you, mm. beside you, around you, that gives you confidence, that gives you what you need to walk in the room with your head held high. And it don't matter who look at you. It don't matter what they say. It don't matter what they whisper. It don't matter what they think. You and God, y'all assured each other that the day was going to be a good day. And keep doing what you got to do. Keep pressing toward that mark, whatever mark that is for you. Your story ain't my story. My story is not your story, but we all have one. It's just like next. We all have a next. Your next might not be my next. My next might not be your next. But we all have one. We all have a next level. We all have a place to go. We all have. It's somewhere God wants us to be. It's something God wants us to do. It's, it's just somebody he wants us to impact. And you got to consult with him to, to know who, who that is and what that is. Amen, Kim. Kai, what I want you to do is to give us your last, um, your comment. And I'm going to need you to pray. Um, I'm going to tell everybody I think we got some announcements but y'all look at them I ain't got nothing to say when the Holy Ghost hovering I know enough about Jesus to let him do what he go do so Kai you give your last remarks and you pray us all um, two, two things well first of all Sister Kim I want you to know that before my husband and I were married Mother's Day of last year we were required to get tested. Uh, we were required to do a full uh, sexual transmitted disease, STD titer, to include an HIV AIDS test. So thank you for uh, affirming and encouraging 
that we all do that. And uh, so we were required. Um, you know, you all hear me in my interfaith stance continuing to go back before between the Quran and the Bible. Uh, but there is, uh, there is, people who don't know anything about the Quran, there is an entire chapter about women. It's called Anissa. And uh, it says, if it is Allah's, if it's God's will to lighten your burden, your burden will be lightened. I think that's that's one of the most beautiful passages for me. And the reason why I used that particular passage to talk about my final uh, thoughts is because as I look at uh, Sister Kim, as I look at Dr. Cook, it appears that scriptural verses is about burning light and burdens is true. Because even in the passage that I chose earlier, it says that that the struggle is momentary and it results in an eternal weight of glory. It's like the eternal weight, the, the eternal weight in glory, the glory of God in essence is heavier than the struggle. What looks like a burden is but a light momentary affliction. The glory that we see in your spirit, the glory that we see in the work that you do, Dr. Cook, the glory that we see in you, uh, Pastor Sandy, for even having us here on tonight, that, that glory is heavier. Come on, somebody. It, it seemed like a struggle at the time. But the glory, the glory that God has on our life, there is somebody that is healed and delivered on tonight, uh, Sister Kim, because of you, there is someone who is healed and delivered on tonight, Dr. Cook, because of you, Sister Sandy, just um, Reverend Sandy, just because you had us on and because you had this platform on tonight, there is someone who is healed, delivered, and restored. And God is getting the glory. And, and it talks about it, even if, if we do what we do for an Adam's way, just an Adam's way to run. Wrong. God does what he does. But when we do what God says do, and we are obedient to God, it's not God. The God just is God is not the only one that gets the glory. God allows us to share so that it can be a benefit for the people. But you understand that God gets the glory but allows us to share. That's that weighty, that's that glory that's heavier, that's more weighty than the struggle. Because there's someone out there that will not see God, but they will see us. There is someone out there, Sister Kim, that will not see God, but they will see you. There is someone out there, Dr. Cook, that will not see God, but they will see you. Reverend Sandy, there is someone out there that will not see God, but they will see you. And those who are, are listening, there is someone out there that will not see God, but they will see us. And what they will see in us, in our stories, and our overcomings, our, our many overcomings, our overcomings from sickness, our overcomings from disease, our overcomings from the grief and despair of loss, our overcomings for challenges with family, all of the many overcomings, they will see the overcomings. And then they will begin to say, how did they get over? Let's pray. Eternal God, we come to you this night. We thank you for how you have brought us together. With a common goal of the uplift of women the healing of community, the understanding that all is not perfect, 
for the blessed assurance that you are God and that beside you there is none other. We thank you for Pastor Sandy on tonight. The foundations for living who allowed this platform. We thank you for Dr. Cook. Thank you for her healing mind, her healing spirit, and her healing touch. We ask you to continue to move in the ministry to which you have called her. And let for every healing touch that she has with an individual become the healing of a nation. God, we thank you right now for Sister Kim. We ask you to move right now in her life. We thank you for the message of overcoming. Overcoming by her testimony. Overcoming by her faith. Not always admitting that she was not always in the church with the belief that it was going to be all right. But pressed her way through until she understood it was all right already. We thank you for the all right already, God. We thank you for the times when we are shamed and it's all right already. We thank you for the times when we feel guilty and it's all right already. We thank you for the people who don't understand. They misunderstand what's going on. They don't listen to the story. They don't know that you are God and beside you, there is none other. They forgot that you work things out for our good. They forgot that if it's your will to lighten our burden, we you will do so. They forgot that every perfect gift comes from you. And that you never leave us nor forsake us. We place our trust in you. And that we trust in you and lean not into our own understanding. There, there is a promise that you will in time make everything all right. They forgot, oh God. But thank you for letting us be that weight in, in, in glory on earth that helps people to remember. That you are God. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That that you are God, that you are healer, that you're a deliverer, that you are a savior, that you set the captives free, that no, no disease is too hard, nothing is, is, is impossible with you, oh God. We thank you. We thank you for letting us be the agents of, of that remembrance that, that people will come to know the reality in serving a true and a living God, and that those who forgot will come back into remembrance that there's nothing too hard for you and every good and perfect gift. And you work all things out for our good. It may not look like it, may not feel like it. It may sound like it's terminal. It may look like it's death. But in the end, you work it out for our good. We don't know the end. Eyes have not seen, neither have ears heard, nor has the heart imagined what you have prepared. All we can do is stay with you, oh God, and stay in the preparation process. God, we bless your name for Pastor Sandy. We bless your name for Foundations for Living. We know that she has her own story. She has her own overcoming, even to be transparent enough to say that we were almost divorced. I had a friend today that preached about almost versus absolutely, that she was almost there. But God, all of us have an almost story, but you have brought us into right relationship, enabling us to know a God who can do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that works in us and that's faith power that's trust power that's owning our own healing power that is counseling and delivering power that is pressing towards the more power that is loving ourself power that is knowing that we're fearfully and wonderfully made power that's grace power that's mercy power that's asking for forgiveness when needed power that is a power that is exceedingly and abundantly above of all that has already been given to us. God continue to anoint and appoint. We've got some, some persons working behind the scene, a married couple. Touch them right now, oh God, in your blessed and holy name. Bind them up in the unity of your spirit, bond of your peace, and keep them as they are. And then everyone on this line, God, we ask 
that you touch. Psalmist said, God, touch me. Oh, God, touch me. And oh, the joy that flooded my soul, something happened. And now I know God touched me and I'm whole. We decree and declare by the power of the Holy Spirit of God that they are touched on today. It is to this end we pray. Let the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, our strength, our Redeemer. Amen, amen, and amen. I love y'all. Good night. God bless you. Thank you. <laughs>